I want first to get used to this microphone. Uh, second, I want to talk to you today about a research project that I am uh, doing with uh, Yanis da Fermos, uh, at, who's now at SOAS, and Joe Michel, who is at the same place that I am, um, University of the West of England in Bristol. And it's a research project that is engaging with and, and trying to bring back to life a Minskian concept of institutional supercycles. Uh, and I'll tell you in a second what these institutional supercycles are and how they are connected to shadow banking. But I want to start with reminding ourselves uh, and, and make this a bit more exciting than a standard heterodox uh, sort of talk. I want to remind ourselves where we are now, and we are in an age of a climate crisis. I don't know how many of you think, uh, agree with that. I am a recent convert, and I, am, I firmly believe in the fact that we are living in a climate crisis. There are lots of protests around the world, uh, including a, a global climate strike, uh, with young people mobilizing in order to try to work out how to change things and to make sure that the Paris agreements on reducing our uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, come true. And very interesting, this is not only happening in the streets, but it's happening in offices uh, of uh, European institutions. Uh, Christine Lagarde, who will very soon become uh, the president of the ECB, has promised that part of, the very important part of her mission is to green the ECB. And what this means in particular, we'll see in, in a while. But we, we have here a, sort of a, a very clear mission statement that the ECB needs to get much closer and much deeper involved into the uh, greening uh, and, and climate uh, uh, fight agenda. It's the same story that we, he, we see with the new European Commission, Franz Timmermans, who is one of the vice presidents. Uh, and I hope you can see it's a bit far away. But Franz Timmermans, uh, when he was appointed, he tweeted, and I'm going to use some, some Twitter insights because everything that, that happens, it happens on Twitter, as you know. Uh, Franz Timmermans said, we need, no, we need an ambitious Green New Deal for Europe, which shapes the future of our children and ensures their health, prosperity, and security on a green and thriving planet, right? And you know, this is not Alessandro ocasio Cortez speaking. It is a, a high-ranking official of the European Commission. Uh, adopting the kind of language that we are used to hear from democratic socialists in the United States. To my mind, that's quite an important change, at least in, in the discursive and in the political uh, 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 discourse of what European institutions are, are willing to do. And it's very clear as well in the United States that somehow Europe is ahead of the game in what compares the United States in dealing with the climate crisis. Okay? And what I'm going to try to address today is the question of what does this actually mean in practice? How do we think about the uh, climate mission that various policymakers in Europe uh, have adopted explicitly? And uh, I'm going to argue that Europe has been a laggard in the financial globalization supercycle. And I'll tell you in a second what I mean by that. Uh, but we have not done very well, particularly in the Eurozone, through a Minskian lens. We haven't done very well in the financial globalization supercycle that started in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. And we may be leaders in what I think is coming, which is a green supercycle. And I'm going to explore the conditions under which Europe can actually put into practice its commitment towards uh, greening the economy. Uh, you will see that my answer to leaders in the green supercycle is a very cautious maybe, uh, but uh, we'll see. Okay, so three things that I'm going to address today very broadly. What are institutional supercycles? And you'll see it's a, it's a Hyman Minsky idea uh, developed by uh, other sort of post Keynesian afterwards. Then I want to make an argument that the Euro area has been a laggard in the financial globalization supercycle because of particular dysfunctionalities and problems in the institutional architecture of the Eurozone. And uh, finally, I'm going to explore the conditions under which the Euro area could become a leader in the green uh, supercycle. Okay. So let's start with what are institutional supercycles? This is an idea that comes from the work of Hyman Minsky uh, in a Ferian Minsky paper that was then picked up by Tom Pally. And it's the idea that there are, we should look for long run institutional cycles where we can trace the endogenous change in, uh, the, in institutions 
and we can connect the dynamic change in, in, in institutions with macrofinancial developments. Uh, these are long-run cycles that have a distinctive distribution of power between capital and labor. Uh, they, they have a distinctive institutional macrofinancial architecture, and they have a distinctive set of hegemonic uh, economic ideas. In other words, it's no coincidence that we are a heterodox economics group in this room. We do not speak to uh, the particular set of hegemonic uh, uh, ideas that are governing the financial globalization supercycle in which we still live. They are longer duration than business and, and financial cycles, and they affect these cycles. Uh, what Hyman Minsky argued is that to think in terms of long-run cycles with this distinctive distribution of power, institutions, and hegemonic economic ideas, one needs to think about thwarting mechanisms. And this is the concept that we pick up from him. And thwarting mechanisms are customs, institutions, and policy interventions that reduce the amplitude of basic economic cycles and they contain economic instability. They put ceilings and floors on the dynamic path of economic system. Uh, and because this is Minsky, he also argued that these thwarting mechanisms who are successful in preventing economic instability for, from becoming explosive, they become gradually eroded with time. Their effectiveness becomes gradually eroded in a sort of logic of the financial instability hypothesis. And there are various uh, forces that are pushing for the erosion of this institution, of the thwarting mechanisms that have to do with private innovation and with long-run instability. And I'll show you in a second what that means. When we, so we take this uh, framework from Minsky and Thomas Paley, and we add, so we add certain ideas from other theoretical frameworks, particularly from international and comparative political economy, where they look at distinctive growth regimes, uh, and from financial geography, where they think through the, the implications of the global arrangements uh, around uh, finance. And more, more in, most importantly, in some ways, we look and draw on the shadow banking literature that emerged in, in, after the global financial crisis in order to try to conceptualize where we are structurally in terms of uh, the makeup of the uh, local and global financial system. Uh, that together with the global financial cycle literature that comes from Helen Ray and several other authors. And in particular, because this was supposed to be a lecture on shadow banking, we are drawing on or building on three seminal papers in the shadow banking literature from Adrian and Sheen, who wrote a really interesting and, and highly influential paper on liquidity and leverage that thought through the mechanisms through which shadow banking emerges and creates financial uh, instability endogenously. Then the famous paper by Zoltan Poshar et al. I don't know if any of you have seen it, which has a very complicated sort of electrical map, uh, map of, of shadow banking. And the paper by Gorton and Metric that looks at uh, the way in which uh, crises triggered by uh, shadow banking are very different from the standard uh, crisis in retail banking. And in general, we work from these papers with an understanding of shadow banking that thinks through activities rather than through institutions. So instead of looking for shadow banks, we are looking for markets and activities that make any bank or, or, or shadow bank be part of the shadow banking universe. And from these activities definition, shadow banking means is defined as the production and financing of tradable securities, of fixed income instruments, or of, of equity. And that's very important. In the financial stability board definition, uh, uh, the production of tradable securities is, is reduced to securitization markets, but that's not necessarily the only uh, uh, fixed income instrument. And financing uh, the markets have to do with the uh, repurchase mar uh, repo or repurchase agreement market and with derivatives markets. And we also uh, need to bear in mind that since 2014, the FSB agenda to transform shadow banking has been, instead of regulating it, make it into resilient market-based finance. And this is very important. And this is very important in terms of Minsk and insights uh, in, in thinking through structural changes in finance in order to understand the effectiveness of uh, the institutions that are governing the economic system. Okay. So with this, in, with this in mind, we propose, where we think through two institutional super cycles, uh, one that started after the Second World War uh, and finishes towards the uh, beginning of the 1980s. We call this the industrial capitalism super cycle, 
We theorize the cycles in terms of four different stages, an expansion, a maturity, a crisis, and a, a genesis phase. In this expansion phase, we have uh, the new set of thwarting mechanisms, new set of institutional arrangements coming up in order to provide new forms of stabilizing a uh, capitalist economy that is fundamentally unstable. In the maturity phase, these uh, thwarting mechanisms become gradually eroded by a set of um, uh, uh, sort of endogenous processes. Then we get the crisis where these thwarting mechanisms become completely unable to, to prevent instability and instability becomes explosive. And with a crisis, we have a new set of mechanisms that are coming through in, in a genesis period. We argue that uh, the, the, I'm, I'm going to focus on the financial globalization supercycle because I don't have a lot of time and I want to talk, talk to you about the coming supercycle, which is the green one. Um, just to notice that the red line, it doesn't come out of empirical data, it's just we draw it to think about how the, the, uh, the effectiveness of thwarting mechanism, which is what the red line is capturing, increases and then falls over time. Okay. So, uh, when we think about the financial globalization supercycle, we think in terms of the redistribution of power towards global finance. And we argue that we can trace there the emergence of a new class within the financial system whose power has steadily increased during this supercycle. And we call this new class neurontiers. And I know there will be a lot of debate of whether neurontiers and rontiers are really that different, but we are using the term neurontier to capture specific business models in finance that are affecting the way in which both economic growth and financial instability unfold over time. So we define your rentiers as those financial institutions whose activities are geared towards the production of new asset classes via shadow banking and market-based finance. And here we are treating shadow banking as a variant of market-based finance. And to give you an example of what we mean by these new rentiers, I'm showing you here the very rapid growth in asset management, and asset managers are financial institutions who are managing assets on behalf of institutional investors, and these include uh, insurance companies, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, the um, uh, cash pools that come from multinational corporations who are very good at hiding or moving their profits around. And you will see that the uh, age of asset management, as Andy Halden uh, terms it, has been uh, increasingly important in, uh, after the global financial crisis. And the shadow banking literature tells us that the reason why we have a growing uh, asset manager class, the reason why we have growing institutional investment, it has to do with the way in which politics in high-income countries has unfolded since the global financial crisis, even before, and with the reduction or the erosion of the welfare state, right? And the erosion of the welfare state, remember the welfare state was an institutional arrangement to de-risk capitalism for the, for the poor and for every one of us by providing public education, by provi providing public health, and by providing uh, public pensions. When these institutions of capitalism are eroded, what we're moving toward is asset-based welfare, right? So we're starting to save through pension funds, we're starting to protect ourselves from health problems through insurance companies, and as corporations, we are starting to protect ourselves from the tax state by moving money around. So shadow banking in this interpretation is a very specific manifestation of the, of the problems that the, has state, that the state has in order to either tax properly multinational corporations or to provide its citizens with uh, insurance against future uncertainties. And to give you a sense of how this important this is, I, I'm, I have here a, a, a graph um, for Germany. Asset management in Germany is pretty significant. You will see asset managers. Uh, uh, there are assets managed for pension funds, for insurance companies that, that are quite significant, and then for other types of institutional in investors. And Germany is quite interesting and, and distinct from other countries because it has sort of local or homegrown institutional investors uh, that are uh, roughly associated, but not all of them, with uh, commercial banks. And you will know that BlackRock, on number 17, I like to talk about BlackRock when I talk about the age of asset management because BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world and is sitting on 7 uh, trillion of US dollars uh, assets that it manages. You notice that BlackRock is not so important in Germany for a variety of reasons that I don't want to go into now, but just to note, when we think about asset managers and we think about shadow banking, we should also think about the way in which we collectively organize ourselves 
uh, as societies to protect uh, ourselves against future uncertainties. Okay, so going back to these neo rentiers and asset managers and institutional investors are part of, of these neo rentiers, so are market based banks. We argue that neo rentiers can be identified in terms of their business model, in the way in which they make profits in, the, in their day to day uh, activities in financial markets. And we are defining these business models as those who have exposure to daily changes in asset prices via mark-to-market uh, balance sheet effects. That is, if you're making money or you need protection from mark-to-market changes in your, the, on the asset side or on the, uh, on the liability side, then you will be a neo and we, we will call you a neo And <clears throat> that, uh, I argue, also comes with a different logic and a, 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 a new type of uh, liability that, uh, uh, that neo rentiers are using in order to finance their securities position, and I call that shadow money, and I'll tell you in a second why that's important. So just to give you a sense, I like to do this for uh, my, I, I work with civil society organizations and I try to explain to them why, this, why it's important to think about financial market structures, and the way I think about shadow banking or market-based finance and the rise of neo rentiers is to compare a standard financial system where, that is dominated by banks with a financial system that is organized around market-based finance and securities markets. And the standard the, the financial system organized around banks will have loans that are making, that will, have, will have banks that are making loans in the process they are issuing deposits. And what we don't see but is quite important during bad times is the interbank money markets where banks are trading reserves issued by the central bank with each other to settle uh, debts to each other. And you can have a developmental state sort of institutional ar arrangement on top of this where certain loans will be directed towards an industrial policy, right? Uh, and deposits in the system are protected, their par value is protected by a social contract with the state, uh, in which the state promises to uh, sort of guarantee your deposits up to a certain level. In a system or in financial globalization where we have market-based finance becoming increasingly important and neo rentiers becoming increasingly important, we have credit created, so I'm abstracting a bit, obviously you have banks in the system as well, uh, you, we have credit created through securities markets, through corporate bonds, through uh, government bonds, through asset-backed securities, and to finance the, crea the creation of these securities, uh, financial institutions either issue a new type of liability called repos or repurchase agreements, and I call this shadow money, uh, or they protect themselves and finance themselves through uh, derivatives positions. And you will see that the, the ecosystem of market-based finance is far more complicated than the ecosystem of the bank-based financial system. You have on one side uh, global institutional investors that I, I've mentioned before, who might be real money, lend, uh, uh, real money lenders, as in they might not use leverage in order to grow their balance sheet, but they will be lending to financial institutions who are looking for leverage, uh, like a, a bond fund or a hedge fund or, or an investment bank. And banks are playing an interesting role here as, as market makers because they are sitting, they are offering their balance sheet sometimes to intermediate credit from one type of uh, uh, neo rentier to another, or they will be providing uh, bid and ask prices, in other words, they will make markets in securities and uh, rely on their market making activities on both uh, repos and derivatives markets. And how does this link to, um, to the idea of business models exposed to, or the neo rentiers as being uh, those financial institutions with business models exposed to daily changes in the prices of securities? I'm giving you here a, an example of uh, the of a hedge fund who is financing itself with a, uh, or is financing its um, um, U.S. treasuries with a, repo tra with a repo transaction, and what it will do, this uh, this hedge fund, it will issue a liability called a repo against those securities to a broker dealer who will accept as a guarantee for the for that uh, liability. Uh, will accept those U.S. treasuries as, as collateral. And what we have in this transaction, if it's longer than overnight, we have a process of ensuring that the market price of collateral and the nominal value of the liability, the repo liability issue, always stays the same. 
In other words, on a day-to-day -day basis, you will have mark-to-market of the uh, collateral securities and you will have margin calls if the, if the market price of those securities goes higher or lower than uh, the repo liability. And in th this is a very interesting uh, and very useful uh, business model for the hedge fund to increase leverage during good times, right? Because the higher the price of securities that it posts as collateral to, to finance in a repo transaction, the more securities it will go get back during good times. It can make margin calls and it can borrow additionally and issue new repos on the basis of that. So the, the hedge fund has a business model that is reliant on daily changes in the uh, prices of securities in the same way that the broker dealer has a, a, a business model that is reliant on daily changes in the prices of securities because for them, if securities prices are falling, it has to start making margin calls on the hedge fund. And where you have the, the potential for making money, you also have the potential for the very complicated interaction between market and funding liquidity because once securities prices are starting to fall and the broker dealer is making margin calls, you have incentives for fire sales and for liquidity spirals. In other words, the uh, repo market and repo liabilities are going to start shrinking uh, during bad times. And this is why it is very well recognized by m most central banks uh, that a financial system that is organized around securities markets is a much more fragile, uh, it has much more complicated systemic fragilities than one that is based on banks. Because the, in the, in the, in the bank-based model, you just, as a central bank, you just need to inject uh, liquidity or central bank reserves unsecured in the interbank money market and you stabilize that system. In the securities market-based financial system, the central bank has no choice at the end but to, uh, to buy securities in order to stabilize uh, uh, banks' ability to tap repo markets, right? So it's a very different logic of central bank interventions. So with this in mind, with this sort of basic concepts of how do we think about the financial globalization super cycle? Why is it that neo rentiers are very much exposed and very much benefiting from daily changes in the prices of uh, securities, either directly or indirectly through their repo and derivative positions, we identify or the, 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 the key features of the financial globalization super cycle. And we argue that uh, the sort of driving force in comparison with industrial capitalism is the production and preservation of tradable financial assets. Uh, there are basic cycles as in industrial capitalism, but they, ref they reflect uh, the combination of cyclical functional distribution of income and neo rentier fragile balance sheets. And this fragility comes from this business model that I, I described before. We identify the thwarting mechanisms that are putting a ceiling and a floor on economic activity uh, and for um, the financial globalization super cycle that has to do, the, the, these are Basel II and then monetarism and infl inflation targeting regime and I can explain more uh, why these are thwarting mechanisms uh, in the question and answer session. And in terms of floors, uh, we have an export-led growth model or for some countries and a debt-led growth model. And what matters here much more than in the industrial capitalism super cycle is the, is the uh, lender of last resort function for central banks because this financial uh, system is much more uh, uh, susceptible to uh, periodic financial instability outbursts. Uh, we also identified two uh, various causes of erosion and the single most important one that is undermining and eroding the effectiveness of these thwarting mechanisms that we describe uh, is the rise of shadow banking. Uh, that is the rise of uh, financial uh, arrangements or financial institutions who are increasingly uh, active in securities markets in repo and, and deliver derivatives markets. And that becomes a bit more precise because we're looking at the way in which the, the, the financial systems are increasingly organized around collateral and the changes in the daily uh, prices of uh, that collateral. We also have long run, run processes that, uh, that matter here, and that is the uh, excessive accumulation of private debt as a mechanism for uh, keeping growth in line and the increasing integration of various countries into the global financial cycle. And we're using this insight from Helen Ray that the global financial cycle is a, the increasingly synchronized movements of asset markets and, and credit markets across countries that are dictated to a very significant extent by the US uh, Federal Reserve monetary policy decisions. So 
with this is the sort of theoretical framework that we, we have developed, and the paper will, uh, will be available very soon. And then we, with this theoretical framework, we are looking for how to uh, describe the financial globalization super cycle for the euro area, starting from uh, the uh, expansionary phase all the way to the global financial crisis. And we're arguing that in, after the 1980s, what we see is that debt becomes a source, a source of growth. This is a, a very well-known mechanism. And shadow banking is starting to grow, and securitization markets are starting to grow. And for Europe specifically, uh, the reliance on repo markets becomes much more important in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, as, the industri as the thwarting mechanisms of industrial capital uh, the industrial capitalism supercycles get eroded. In other words, for example, when in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, most central banks in, in the euro area, so well before the euro area, more, most central banks in Europe decide to give up or to, to become uh, formally independent from the treasury, and the treasury needs to start financing itself on uh, government bond markets, you see a push for a uh, creating and deregulating repo markets all over Europe in order to allow for new rentiers or market-based banks uh, to uh, help the, the state and, and debt management offices finance. In the maturity phase, we see shadow banking is no longer a, a mechanism or an institution that is, is pushing and, um, uh, or promoting growth, but it becomes a source of erosion of the standard institutions that are stabilizing capitalism. And I'll show you in a second how that applies to both government debt and to uh, the lender of last resort function of, of the central bank. And what we see then in the crisis is that lender of last resort does not work. And I think this is one of the most critical insights that you get from uh, having a shadow banking lens, and I'll talk a, a bit more about this tomorrow. Uh, lender of last resort be becomes ineffective as a policy intervention in the euro area precisely because it is done in the same way that neo uh, do it, that is, is done through a collateral-based uh, liquidity provision. And I would argue that what we're seeing now is a green super cycle that is emerging. So let's see very quickly how, how uh, in the financial globalization maturity phase, what we are seeing is that uh, the institutions of the state that are governing the economy and are providing thwarting mechanisms are accommodating neo rentier practices or neo rentier business models. They are adopting the way in which neo rentiers are organizing their balance sheet, both on the asset side and on the liability side. And we see first a shift in most central banks in the way that they organize monetary policy implementation during good times and as a lender of last resort to uh, repurchase agreements. And you can see that in terms of the margining practices of central banks before and after the euro crisis. And you will see that before the introduction of the euro, no central bank did mark-to-market margin calls and haircuts in the, in, uh, in the euro area. And after the introduction of the, the euro, we are moving towards a daily uh, uh, mark to market and margin call or risk management uh, regime for the European Central Bank. This is the same for the US, but uh, because of the way in which the euro architecture is, is set up, you will see that this is particularly problematic and destabilizing for the euro area. We also see that the most European countries and in the euro area are importing the financial architecture of the U United States. In other words, they are importing a model for organizing the government bond market that is very similar to, or almost identical, except for some legal uh, aspects, is very similar to the US financial markets, where you have government, the government bond market very tightly linked to the repo market for uh, reasons that have to do with uh, questions of liquidity. Uh, and in the uh, late uh, 1990s, uh, particularly after the crisis of the LTCM, and we argue the crisis of the LTCM is what tips uh, the, um, uh, the, super, the financial globalization supercycle into its uh, uh, maturity phase, what we are seeing is, an emergent, is a recognition in central banking circles, like the Bank for International Settlement, that government debt is very different and it has a role that is not fiscal. And that's very, a very important insight. In market-based financial systems, government debt doesn't simply serve the role 
of matching the difference between spending and revenue. It also serves, save, uh, serves as a safe asset for new rentiers who during bad times need a safe asset to work as collateral in order to maintain their financing via repo markets. And we know that for a, 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 a very long time there is a set of papers from the BIS in 1999 that describes in detail why we should think of the financial life of government bonds and how, these are, uh, how this is important to promote in the idea that government bonds are safe assets for market-based finance. Then we have the crisis, and in the crisis what we see is that the ECB, who I remember, uh, adopted practices of collateral management from neorantiers. The ECB's lender of last resort provision is actually destabilizing for the, low, for the banking system. And what do I mean by this? This is a graph, and this is a long-standing debate with Joe Michel, so Joe, I'm going to go with my version of how this is happening. Uh, this, is a, this is a graph from the a Banque de France paper that shows the way in which the, the, the effects of the amount of collateral that banks post at the ECB uh, after uh, well, since January 2011. And you will see that, what, that, that you have a negative effect on the outstanding amount of collateral that comes from price effects, right? So this bit here are the price effects, and these are the price effects that come from marking to market Greek government bonds or Spanish government bonds or Irish government bonds that are falling in price. In other words, if you're a bank, Greek or not, but typically Greek, if you're a bank, Greek bank who borrows from the ECB or from the Euro system, from the Greek central bank, against Greek government bonds, if the price of these bonds is falling, you're basically having, getting a margin call from the central bank who, instead of giving you liquidity during bad times, is asking you to provide more collateral during bad times because it's doing mark to market. And we see these price effects, they're quite significant, and you will see in, in net terms the price, price effects are far more important, uh, and they stop when, this, when the European Central Bank says outright monetary transactions. And outright monetary transactions are a new thwarting mechanism for the financial globalization super cycle that basically promises to provide liquidity and to maintain the safe asset quality of government bonds for uh, the euro area member states. It comes with a lot of complications around it and with conditionality, and that's a significant problem. But what we know is that a lender of last resort function in the euro area, in, this, in the financial globalization super cycle, is completely ineffective in uh, preventing a financial crisis. We all, and we see that, for, for example, from the discussion that we have in the euro area on the single safe asset. And that discussion alludes to the fact, either directly or indirectly, if you're in German company, that basically the Bund, the, the, the government debt issued by Germany, enjoys an exorbitant privilege that is reinforced by the ECB the lender of last resort framework, and that's a problem because we would like to have a, a monetary union where it's not one single country that issues the safe asset for that monetary union, particularly because this country has a debt break or a schwarze null, and it, it's, its ideas about issuing government bonds are completely disconnected uh, or unconnected to the financial stability requirements of a market-based financial system. So what you get out of this, uh, Political obstacles to the emergence of new thwarting mechanisms is austerity and political instability for a long time. And I just want to note that market maker of last resort in, in the UK was much easier, was completely politically uncontroversial. In 2015, the Bank of England even wrote it down in its new uh, red book, in its new operational framework. It said, we will do market maker of last resort for, for core securities markets because we need to stabilize market-based finance and we need to stabilize new rentier liabilities. They didn't say new rentier liabilities, but uh, that's the analytical framework we're using. Okay. So what we had in the euro area during the crisis phase is a systematic destruction, although not purposefully, a systematic dis destruction of national safe assets and of the ability of local banking systems to rely in, in, in many cases on their local government bonds as safe, safe asset, right? And this is, uh, there is a speech by Benoit Couret uh, who describes in some ways uh, 
the, the importance of thinking about collateral-based liquidity provision uh, when he talks about uh, sovereign debt, debt in the euro area in terms of safe assets. And, and you have there a, a uh, recognition that collateral and, and, and with extended uh, uh, repo liabilities are money in a uh, bank-based finance, bank sorry, market-based financial system. Okay. So uh, that's the, 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 the analysis that we have through this, theoret this theoretical framework is that Europe did very bad in the, did, didn't do very well in the, the financial globalization super cycle because the thwarting mechanisms that should have emerged in order to stabilize uh, market-based finance or shadow banking in the euro area could not emerge due to very significant political obstacles. So let's see, uh, now I want to spend uh, Five, ten more minutes thinking about how we could become leaders from, uh, from laggards. And uh, when we think about a green super cycle, we think about high economic activity and employment without undermining ecological sustainability. This is a very difficult proposition. It's both have your cake and, and eat it. And I want to, to think a, a bit about uh, the existing, particularly the, the existing uh, UK strategy for creating the thwarting mechanisms for, for a green super cycle. Okay. But first, remember most discussions of climate change and the, the overall logic of a green super cycle will be to design transitions, just or not, to a net, a net zero carbon, um, or in, in German, Grüne Null. Right? And there are two ways in which this transition could be designed, I think. And we can observe these two very distinctive paradigms if you look closely at policy discussions in Brussels or in Washington, or if you look on the streets uh, in, in Berlin or in London. Right? And one is maximize private finance for the environment. In other words, we can have an extension of the financial globalization super cycle where the neo rentiers if we work with them carefully, will provide a solution to the climate crisis. And I call this the Wall Street climate consensus. There is a very distinctive solution that says Green New Deal. We need fiscal resources to be mobilized on an scale that is precedented only or parallel to the industrial capitalism super cycle, and there you will get a green developmental state, however you want to define it, with a very significant indust green industrial policy arm that will make sure that you reallocate resources from uh, high carbon activities to, to, towards low carbon activities. I'm sorry to say that unfortunately it seems like the first version is going to, to sort of win the political war at least for a while, and I'll tell you in a second uh, why. Right? So remember, uh, the Wall Street climate consensus reflects the political power of the neo rentiers that was established during the global financial globalization super cycle and could not be significantly eroded by the global financial crisis. And there are some interesting questions of the, why that's the case when we think about the 1930s uh, and the, um, the, the Great Depression. And the story that the Wall Street climate consensus is telling us now, and you can find this story in, 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 in various um, sort of public documents, is that the, we have institutional investments with trillions, and I showed you the trillions, with, with trillions who are looking for sustainable investments. So if you, we leverage private finance, we will, uh, we will get to a climate change solution. Uh, we also have new rules of the game being written of what does it mean, what does sustainable mean, right? This is a, a very important trick to be, or very important question to be sorted. And in order to distinguish between what are brown assets and what are green assets, that is, brown assets are assets that are financing high carbon or fossil fuel uh, activities, green assets are low carbon uh, activities, right? And what we're seeing is the emergence of two ways of thinking about green and brown that are, that are relevant uh, and could become part of new thwarting mechanisms. One is a private ESG framework where uh, private providers very similar to cre credit rating agencies are uh, coming up with uh, ways of measuring the environmental, social and governance performance of a company or of a country and creating a system of rating that allows a institutional investor with a, a sustainability mandate like my pension fund to say on ESG ratings, this company is doing very well, it's, it's very high up, it has a rating of AAA, I will invest in it, right? The alternative is a public taxonomy that is being 
developed by the European Commission uh, and will, was supposed to come into, into um, sort of law next year, but it has been delayed. And this public taxonomy looks very different in the way that it identifies green and brown, and I'll talk to you in a second. So the Wall Street consensus says we have institutional investors with trillions. We should encourage them to go into sustainable activities. These sustainable activities are defined through a private ESG framework. And once we have the private ESG framework, we have to create the market conditions for sustainable financial products to emerge. In other words, we have to encourage green. And we have to subsidize green to uh, the, the extent that is possible, either through the central bank's balance sheet uh, uh, and collateral framework, or through uh, capital requirements. We do not penalize brown. And we'll see this is very important. Not penalizing brown is a, is a, is a complicated political decision, and, and one that doesn't reassure me very much about uh, progress in the climate uh, change uh, fight. The last element of this uh, are fiscal measures, and this is part of the new, th new set of thwarting mechanisms to fight climate change that is, uh, it is envisaged, and most countries are putting it now into law, that you will get a gradual increase in carbon price. And the, the, as an IMF representative put it, steep but not disruptive. The idea is to, to gradually increase carbon price or put carbon taxes in order to, to ensure that you give companies and the market time to adjust to these new prices, but at the same time, the carbon price becomes biting at some point. Okay? And we see, for example, in Germany's new climate plan that this is a version of the Wall Street climate consensus. It's managed to upset about everybody, which is uh, unsurprising in some ways. Uh, the Fridays for Future, the, the climate activists do not like it because it's very unambitious in the uh, uh, things that it proposes. It is governed by the logic of Schwarz and Null. In other words, it, there will be carbon taxes, and the revenues from carbon taxes will be redirected towards green investments. But forget about uh, additional fiscal resources invested in, uh, in a sort of a Green New Deal. The German farmers don't like it either because they think they are being demonized without any support in return. Not very different from Macron's um, gilet jaune in some ways. Uh, I want to spend a bit more time on, on thinking about how these thwarting mechanisms are being envisaged. Because remember, our framework says that we need to think about the powerful actors who are, through their innovations, who are eroding or making the emergence of new thwarting mechanisms possible. And what we see here in the UK Green Finance Strategy that was published in July 2019 is what happens when you allow private finance or the new rentiers to collaborate in writing a green finance strategy, right? And it's basically a rules of the game that is set up for, uh, for, uh, the, the, for new rentiers within a logic of this Wall Street climate consensus. So the UK green finance strategy says, yes, we are a very ambitious country. We really want to get to net zero by 2050. However, we will do it through what I call a deregulated decarbonization strategy. In other words, no significant thwarting mechanisms to see here. The UK Green Finance Strategy says you, you can use the private ESG taxonomies in order to redirect your investments at your pace from brown to green. If there is a disclosure of climate risk, it should be voluntary under the TCFD framework of uh, the uh, Bank of England. And that's a long discussion about why Bank, Bank of England is at the forefront front of uh, creating new frameworks for disclosing climate risks. There are some carrots for greening the mortgage market, but no direct state investment in, in housing. And very important, this, the, the UK is treating the climate crisis as a strategic opportunity for the city to uh, uh, increase its competitiveness in green finance. Okay? So I would say that this is greenwashing financial globalization, and it raises some interesting questions for our theoretical framework, because to get a green super cycle, you need to get thwarting mechanisms that are effective. And this is not an effective uh, set of thwarting mechanisms. This is basically a, a, a making a gift for, uh, for, for the new rentiers. And I looked through, uh, yesterday I was talking about this to a different audience, and I looked through the German uh, uh, green finance strategy. It's not as well articulated as the, the UK's. Uh, it is a delightfully ambiguous, I would say. Uh, if you look at this uh, scheme here, I have no idea what it actually means in practice, but we know there will be system analysis, action fields, there will be relevance and need for change. Um, and if you dig a little bit more into what they actually mean, uh, it's very clear that 
to my mind, that there are similarities to the UK strategy. In other words, uh, it's written black on white. There is an aspiration to establish Germany as a leading location for sustainable finance, which is allow the market to identify what kind of green products it would like to provide instead of uh, having a more decisive regulatory intervention. Uh, very important, it's also uh, anchored in, in an ESG framework. So going with the, with the logic of identifying brown and green uh, according to uh, the ESG approach. And you'll say, why do we care about taxonomies? And I think this is one of the, the, the tricks that, I don't know how you want to call it, neoliberalism, fi financialization, but the current political arrangements that we have are hiding the politics in very technocratic discussions. This is an example of hiding the politics in very technocratic discussions because deciding what is green and what is brown will set the agenda and will influence the way in which we respond to the climate crisis for the next 30 years. And the private finance says we should decide what is green and what is brown through ESG investing, and through the ESG framework. And that's a, the ESG framework is a system of aggregating a set of, uh, or data on a set of indicators that go, goes from climate, from the E, from environmental climate change, carbon emissions, etc., to S, social issues and G-governance, G right? And with this, you can make a, um, a sort of rating, you, you get ESG data and you can aggregate them into a rating that says Tesla is a highly ESG perform performing uh, company, you should buy equity in there if you, if you want to um, uh, move uh, or if you want to do uh, um, impact investment and or if you want to green your balance sheet. And the problem with that we know is, is that the same incentives that you have in the credit rating agencies universe, you have them in the ESG world, probably much stronger uh, in the ESG world because there are many different providers of ratings and the, the way in which they choose the relevant data and the way in which they aggregate, aggregate this data is very subjective. So what we, come, what we see is subjective and conflicting ratings. This is a graph that I found from Financial Times and it, it compares the ratings of MSCI and FTSE um, and these are two very significant providers. And you will see that you can rank very high on FTSE and very low on, on MSCI or the other way around, right? And that opens up the question of greenwashing, which is very important. In other words, if a regulatory framework comes under which uh, your ESG ratings uh, above a certain level will, will treat your assets as green and above, below that level as brown, I will start shopping for a company that gives me a high ESG rating for my portfolio. And that's the possibility of greenwashing is very significant. And we know that most uh, institutional investors are now trying to play this game and create uh, uh, links with uh, ESG providers, including in this case, MIAG, which is a, um, I don't know how you pronounce it in German, is one of the largest institutional asset managers in Germany. Okay, and we have a lot of evidence that there is greenwashing happening via um, uh, ESG. Uh, including uh, BlackRock, who claims to be a climate change fighter, but in practice is preventing fossil fuel companies from actually adjusting uh, and increasing at least the accountability of their, of their CEOs. MSCI, who's an ESG provider, has created a, an ESG index for index investment that has uh, JP Morgan Chase in the top 10 performance of e on ESG criteria. Uh, although uh, Chase uh, has been financing quite significant uh, fossil fuel uh, uh, investments. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop and finish in, uh, in five minutes, uh, a bit more patience. Why is the EU taxonomy? And I think this is important. There is a public alternative and always the, the logic of thwarting mechanisms in, in our framework is that the state has to somehow create a set of, of mechanisms that can prevent or can manage uh, systemic instability. And the European state has, is going some way into that direction with the European Commission who's saying we don't want private finance to decide what is green and what is brown, we would rather do it ourselves. Uh, and they have a, a taxonomy that is distinguishing or identifying activities that are green or not green. And an activity is green, an economic activity is green and therefore lending to that economic activity through whatever financial instrument is green if it meets one of, if it does substantive progress on one of these six objectives that go, goes from climate mitigation to adaptation to uh, healthy ecosystems, and it does no 
harm on the other five, right? It, there are some loopholes in there and there are some problems that need to be sorted, but it's in, in, to my mind, it's a much better way of distinguishing between green and brown uh, than, uh, than the private ESG framework. And that's a way of, uh, uh, an example of how you aggregate across different companies and you, you come up with a green e with an equity fund that is green because it's about 50% uh, invested in activities that are taxonomy eligible. Okay, so very important, there is a way to think about green and brown uh, in a taxonomy that is provided by, by uh, the state. Unfortunately, uh, this taxonomy is no longer, a, um, or for the moment, it has been put on the, on the back burner, and we are staying with the ESG, and the overall, and I, I would want to use the example of Germany here, the overall difficulty uh, of moving into a green super cycle is trying to relax and to change the relationship between uh, the, uh, or to create new thwarting mechanisms that uh, can generate green investment and can redirect investment towards low carbon activities. And I have this graph uh, and uh, this uh, picture that can, tries to capture the way in which the macroeconomic arrangements and the thwarting mechanisms are going to work or not for uh, greening the economy. And if you are in a regime of schwarz and null or, of, or of, uh, of a dead break, it's very difficult to come up with an, uh, uh, an alternative that will meaningfully redirect the economy towards uh, uh, low carbon activities. And what is necessary in order to have these uh, low carbon activities? To have a green super cycle, you first need to have a proper taxonomy that is created by the public uh, or by the state uh, with as much distance from private finance as possible. And then this taxonomy needs to be used in order to green the monetary policy framework, to green the collateral framework, because at the moment the ECB does not distinguish between green and brown assets when it lands, and that means that it is basically subsidizing brown activities by not doing so. And you can green the collateral framework, you can in in introduce mandatory disclosures, and then you can introduce green macroprudential policies in order to make sure that uh, you, you reduce the cost of capital for green activities and you increase the cost of capital and the availability of capital for, uh, um, for uh, brown activities. Of course, the problem that any central bank will tell you is that a very ambitious uh, plan to move towards a, a green economy will create transition risks. And that's something that uh, uh, an, a green super cycle needs to think of in terms of the space of thwarting mechanisms that are available. Transition risks are those risks uh, to financial assets that come from a strong regulatory regime. In other words, if tomorrow I, will, I, I as the ECB say I will put a 50% haircut on all brown assets that are posted as collateral uh, by commercial banks, I'm basically increasing the cost of financing these uh, brown assets, not only at the ECB, but in private uh, financial markets as well. And the ECB will say, well, this creates transition risks that can become systemic, so we can't really regulate that much for, for climate change because we don't want to have a financial crisis. And this is a very interesting framing that we have, which is to say climate crisis versus financial crisis. And this, uh, that, that can only be sorted, I think, by uh, basically returning to a very standard Keynesian regime of coordination between monetary and fiscal policy and a much low, bigger balance sheet for the state. I think that's where we're heading now in terms of the political struggle in, in Europe, both in the euro area and, and abroad. And the euro area has its specific uh, problems uh, that could be sorted with a green FTT to sort of circumvent some of the problems, uh, some of the restrictions on bigger balance sheets for the state and a single safe asset for, uh, for the euro area to relieve Germany from the burden of providing the single safe asset to, to Europe. Okay. I will conclude here to just say that if we, the European institutions will, ha will initiate a new super cycle, there will have to be a clear transition path for greening the central bank balance sheet, financial system, and the economy. And that is with a set of credible sorting mechanisms need to be set up. And for that transition path to be just, so we don't have a Chilean style uh, uh, out in the streets, uh, protest against the structural violence of, of capitalism, uh, we will, there will need to be a very significant shift in the economic ideas that are hegemonic 
from the financial globalization supercycle, and we need to reshape the macrofinancial architecture in terms of much more important role for, for, the, for the fiscal arm of the state and a re return to the subordination uh, of monetary policy to fiscal objectives. Okay, thank you, and I don't know if I took too long, thanks. Ah, more details here. Questions? How does it, who is in charge? Yes, okay. Here. Two microphones. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation. It made me curious about a lot of things, so thank you very much. And Well, I just wanted to make one of the questions, but I, I would like if you could talk a little bit more about the, the role of the inflation targeting as a threatening mechanism, so how and why it is, it is so. Should we take more or, okay. Hello, um, I wonder why is the um, single safe asset a burden for Germany? Hello, thank you very much for your nice presentation. I have a question, do you imagine the, um, the sh in your new super cycle, the green super cycle, the um, shadow banking system to be phased out or is it on top of that basically? Okay, I'll, I'll take these ones and then, um, okay, so uh, inflation targeting emerges as a, as a thwarting mechanism because it provides a, f a, a new policy framework under which to stabilize inflation, right? And to, st to, to deal with what Caldor, uh, and, and there is a very interesting paper by, um, no, by Kaletsky on why, why there, there are uh, uh, forces in industrial capitalism that are eroding uh, stability and eroding the successfulness of thwarting mechanisms in the same way that, uh, that in the same logic that there are forces that eroding the, uh, sorry, I will try to get there, the effectiveness of thwarting mechanisms in financial globalization. And inflation targeting comes in to provide a framework under which you can stabilize prices and you can allow particularly neo rentiers or financial institutions to take positions without worrying about uh, uh, about inflation. So that's, that, to my mind, is very important. And it provides also an institutional framework for separating the central bank or the, the monetary arm of the state from uh, the fiscal arm of the state. Uh, here, in, in terms of what we have in the, in the paper and in, in how we conceptualize uh, the erosion of uh, thwarting mechanisms in the industrial capitalist super cycle, we have wage price spirals and, and oligopoly structures that are basically pushing for uh, or, or reproducing inflationary pressures. And there is a very long debate of what caused inflation in the 1970s. I don't want to go, to, to go into that now, but inflation targeting emerges as a regime that successfully stabilizes in the beginning um, uh, uh, inflation and allows for the emergence of a much uh, uh, larger financial system. Why is the single safe asset a burden for Germany? You are very right. I did not phrase it properly. It is a burden for the rest of the Eurozone, not for Germany. Thank you. Uh, and I to just elaborate, um, I mean, it is a comfortable position to know that in, during crisis, everybody will run into your government bond market. Uh, and that is, uh, paradoxically, uh, it's a, although it's a, it's a comfortable position, it, it's not one that encourages, encourages Germany to borrow more in order to invest in its infrastructure which is a, a, a mystery to me, but that's where we, we are now. Uh, I think there is a recognition, and there, are various, there will be various people in the audience here or presenting that, that will discuss how do we deal with this fundamental shortcoming of the Eurozone architecture in the sense that we, we really shouldn't burden Germany and the, the particular preferences of the, of the German public with uh, the levels of uh, government debt that are necessary for financial stability purposes in, uh, in the Euro area. There are some very wonky solutions to that, including uh, securitizing government debt. This is a, a proposal that has gone through the Euro European Parliament. Uh, I would prefer that there is a more public one, but that brings us into complicated political territory. 
which incidentally a green supercycle could probably solve uh, because it will change the political appetite for lots of things, I think. Uh, can the shadow banking system be phased out? I think that's a very difficult question because if one takes seriously the idea that you either have a Green New Deal or you have the Wall Street climate consensus and these are fundam politically fundamentally opposed propositions, then obviously you need to somehow, if you want to have a new super cycle, you need to change power structures in, the, uh, in, in Western capitalism at least to take away or to reduce the power of, of finance. And we saw that happening in the 1930s. I would argue that we had the financial globalization super cycle from the end of the 19th century all the way to 1929, 1933, and we saw the end of that financial globalization super cycle because the US, for a variety of complex reasons, under Roosevelt decided to basically outlaw new rentiers. And it did so. It introduced legislation that d did away with institutional investors. It's very interesting if you read the history of the US uh, capitalism, you will notice that what, I'm dis what we're describing here as neo rentiers were sort of roaming Wall Street in the late 19th century doing repo transactions and financing themselves through shadow banking. There were trust funds, there were insurance companies that are very, very similar in terms of the ecosystem. What we is not similar is the willingness of, um, or the, the political context under which it is possible to get rid or to reduce the power of the new rentiers. And this is something that I think we see in the streets in the sense that the, the populism and the political mobilization against elites or the existing social arra uh, political arrangements, however you want to call them, are to some extent a consequence of the fact that we don't have political systems that can accommodate very significant structural changes in the way that we organize capitalism. And that is necessary, I think, in order to get to a green super cycle. How we do that, I don't know. Uh, I have my questions, but I think if, if we take the climate crisis seriously and if we get more serious climate events, if this will happen, political appetite for doing things differently will, will change. Whether it will change towards an authoritarian state and shadow banking or towards a kind of Keynesian friendly state that we think of, uh, unless shadow banking is, is not clear to me. Thank you for your presentation. My question would be that, uh, what's your personal view on a synthetic safe asset, maybe a green safe asset in the future? Thank you. Thank you, excellent presentation as always. Uh, I wonder what you think, um, how the business model of private banking is in general compatible with sustainability goals. Mm. And if we perhaps as a second question have to democratize banking or get rid of, well, I'm not, uh, you know, transform finance the way it's, uh, yeah, uh, conducted at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hi. Um, going back to that uh, point of um, uh, inflation targeting being a uh, sailing to the um, to the super cycle, and you've mentioned also that uh, Basel II is mm -hmm. uh, a sailing to the super cycle. I've been wondering. Why? Because one can think that Basel II has encouraged banks to to put prices in its in its own assets and manage uh, their own ass assets with the models, uh, proprietary models. And also, I think that inflation targeting focusing only on um, current prices mm -hmm. allowed asset prices to go up. And in this sense, it could be like um, contributing to the to the uh, to the upside mm. of the super cycle instead of putting a ceiling on it. So those are the questions. Okay. Shall I take them? No. Okay. So uh, first, going back to 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 your okay. Let's start with the last one. Um, is uh, so Basel, 
what, what you have described is precisely this Minskian insight of the erosion of the effectiveness of the thwarting mechanism, right? Because inflation targeting comes uh, and, and becomes a policy framework that initially works to stabilize prices. I mean, okay, we can have arguments whether it was real inflation targeting or repressing labor. Uh, it's, a, it's a longer story. Uh, but at least in, in sort of on ostensibly, inflation targeting works at the beginning to stabilize prices, but because it creates, it, it brings us to a regime of low and stable interest rates and low and stable prices, it generates what uh, the literature calls, calls the risk-taking channel, right? So you have low interest rates to finance, you have low inflation, so you don't need to worry about that. You grow your balance sheet and you grow leverage through the shadow banking system as much as you want. So that, to, for us, is an example of how, with time and because of changes in the financial structure, that are allowed, in a sense, by the, the project of financial deregulation. And I, th I think this is something that, um, that, I mean, when we think about the, the different uh, super cycles, we are, we are very clear and, uh, that the means can inside that finance, when you let finance roam free, things are going to be much more volatile and the ups and downs of the basic cycles are going to be more significant than the ones you have in industrial capitalism. Because the political struggles there are, are a bit let's say, a bit less complicated by, by finance. So in that sense, you're right. Uh, there, are, there are ways, I mean, Basel II did not restrain anybody from doing anything in the, same, in the way that Basel III is now. Like if we think about the effectiveness of Basel III uh, and why it will be very soon repealed, I, I, I have a sense. Uh, that has to do with the, with the financial globalization. Is the business model of banking compatible with sustainable goals? Uh, that is a difficult question. <laughs> if you ask a, a politician to, I mean, I would say that there is a scenario under which if you have a taxonomy that is credible uh, and that is produced at, at arm's length from uh, private interests and from vested interests, and if you use that taxonomy in order to, to impose brown haircuts and brown margins on private transactions and to reward uh, uh, green activities, in a sense what you are doing is you're taking the banking system by the hand through a process of greening their balance sheet that is not very dramatic. But I think we have to recognize that if climate crisis is serious, and I, I personally think that, then the finance will have to take a period, or a period that can be short or medium or relatively short of low profitability like very low profitability, you can't solve the climate crisis or you can't address the climate crisis, maybe sort, solve it is too ambitious, but you can't address the climate crisis by making everybody happy. This is not a win-win scenario. It is a, we all lose a little bit, uh, let's see how the distribution of losses uh, is organized by the state. That, that's my, my view is that's the best way to move forward. Whether this can happen within, with a, a, a financial system where you have very powerful institutional investors, where you have very powerful asset managers, is a different order of, of magnitude. But I do not know any political party that is willing to, to do the things that need to be done now, which are, I would say, in, in the logic of the green super cycle, you have to go and say, well, you know, nationalizing pension funds is, or insurance companies is not such a bad idea because their exposure to stranded assets is so significant that we will have to nationalize them anyways 20 years from now. Let's just do it now and then free ourselves from the constraints of worrying what our measures will do to pension fund liabilities or to pension fund assets. Uh, so, but I don't know. I, I, do, I don't see the German Green Party proposing to nationalize pension funds yet. Um, maybe it will happen. Uh, but that's, that's the kind of political discussion that we need to have in terms of thinking through what is necessary to do to the financial system in order to allow ourselves to finance a Green New Deal. Uh, on the synthetic safe assets, uh, if you refer to the synthetic safe asset proposal uh, that the European Commission has, the ESBIS pro, pro, uh, pro project, which is securitizing sovereign bonds, uh, I, I would just reproduce what private finance thinks about it, about it, which is it's a crazy technocratic fix to a very serious political problem. That is, if the idea is that if you put German and Greek government bonds together, and then you securitize them and you issue two tranches, one a safe tranche and, and possible, well now there are two junior and mezzanine tranche, 
uh, somehow you will distribute risk in the euro area without, uh, without joint liabilities. I think uh, private finance doesn't particularly like it. That management offices ac across the euro area don't particularly like it. The economics is not there in terms of the relative profitability of the various tranches. So I don't know. It's a, it's the, it's the, it's a very European way of responding to a very European problem in the least effective way possible. I, I do not trust it very much, but there are people in the audience, and you will hear tomorrow, that have more confidence in, 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 the, in using securitization as a fix for a political problem. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question um, with regards to nationalizing uh, pension funds. Um, so, I understand, I think, where you're coming from, mm. but it seems to me like not a very innovative um, solving of the problem because it seems regressive. It seems like going back to what we've had before, and that's not a progressive approach towards solving a problem. So maybe then democratizing means something else than just nationalizing. Mm. Um, so it may mean something like collectivizing. Maybe you have something on that. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. I am just wondering, you, like we, if we understand the climate crisis as that, as a crisis, and that uh, for it to be fixed, you need very disruptive policies to the way we consume and the way uh, finance is done and the way uh, everything that you mentioned, right? So wouldn't this disruptive policies kind of go the other way in this super cycle? It would be a crisis that would then lead to an expansion, not like an expansion, you know, not up and then down. Mm. No, shall I go with this tool? Um, Hmm, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what being progressive means, really. I, I would not like to think that, uh, that recalling successful institutional arrangements, at least for a while, uh, shouldn't be, or, or thinking historically should be outside the, uh, the purview of, of progressive economists, or however you want to call us. I think you are right in the sense of we also, the, what this, theoretical framework shows us is that any institutional arrangement in capitalism is going to be subjected to powerful endogenous forces of institutional erosion. So that doesn't mean that you will get a green super cycle with no pension funds that will work miraculously. I have my very strong doubts about that, but you know, there is, this is something that one needs to cope, to think through uh, um, in terms of the, the scale and the immensity of the problem that climate crisis is posing. So uh, I don't, I cannot think of how, I mean, I, I come from the experience of the UK where our pension funds in higher education are under continuous attack. Uh, and our experience of trying to defend our pension funds from a very, I would say, very neoliberal forces, you don't have to call them some, something very extravagant, uh, has been quite unsuccessful. Uh, so this is one of the great ironies of this uh, financial globalization super cycle, that in a sense we are, uh, we are participants in it by virtue of being uh, forced to save through financial markets, but we are not benefiting a lot from it. So my, my pension contributions have increased, my, my promised pensions is, is decreasing, and I'm imagining this will be the case, and I don't even want to imagine what will happen if we implement a, a, a greening finance policy without a, a particular system, without, without the state properly involved, because I'll probably have no pension at the end. Um, that's, that's what I'm looking at. So how would we collectivize, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in exploring ideas. I have no commitment to nationalizing pension funds particularly. But I can, I, if I have to think through the power dynamics and I have, to, I have to think through the conversations that need to be had and through the energy that needs to be invested in either collectivizing pension funds or doing something more uh, useful with our time as economists, as in 
if you are converted to the green transition, what are you going to invest in? How do you, how do you redesign economic activity on a scale that reduces uh, our carbon footprint? These are very complicated questions. And I don't want to, I'd, I'd rather address this than sit in a room, uh, fight with the uh, other five pensioners about what is uh, collectively the best set of uh, assets to invest in. But yeah, that's me. I've done some politics in Romania and I have uh, experience of, of uh, debating uh, long <laughs> hours on, on what, what needs to be done and it's frustrating. So I'm thinking big state, uh, probably easier solution in some ways. With a, with a lot of democratic accountability. There are people who are working on the democratic accountability of the state and that we have to bear in mind. That states in industrial capitalism weren't always that nice. They were quite repressive, particularly states in the global north towards states in the global south. And um, disruptive policies. I think you are right in the sense that uh, to get transformational policies that are necessary to start a green super cycle, you need to have very a change in in political willingness. Now, I, if I understood your question correctly, you, I think you were asking whether the kind of transformational policies that we need, or what we call trans thwarting mechanisms, will emerge without a very serious crisis. I mean, I think we are in a very serious crisis. It's just not hit home in the same way. I live in the UK, so I feel like we are constantly in a crisis of some sorts. Uh, but we are in a very serious crisis. Why it hasn't changed political willingness, uh, I don't know, but I think it might very soon, because a year ago, there were not many people talking about the climate crisis in the same way that they are talking now. So the, the momentum we, and the politics is going towards creating the conditions for transformational, uh, uh, transformative policies. We just need to recognize that it, they, this is a complicated message. It's not necessarily a message of hope. It's a message of we need to get, go through a lot of change, and some of this will be uncomfortable. Uh, here. You are absolutely right about the shadow banking sector, its importance and implications. Now, we know that in prior to the global financial crisis, that sector had increased substantially in the United States, not so much elsewhere but in the United States, and that was one of the main causes of the financial crisis. Mm. As we talk, there is evidence that the growth of the uh, parallel banking sector has exceeded the growth of pre-crisis, of their pre-crisis growth. And that is in terms of the globalized debt obligations, mm. but also of the globalized loan obligations. If the past can teach us anything about the future. Do you think that we are around the corner of the next financial crisis? Mm. Um, I would say that probably not because we now have thwarting mechanisms to stabilize shadow banking. So that my, my I mean, we, I know we have CLOs increasing and the CLOs are problematic. But at least I think Europe and the, and the UK have institutional mechanisms in the central bank for dealing with the ways in which shadow banking generates systemic fragilities, right? So it can stabilize asset markets. It has a, the, the Bank of England has a mandate. The, the, only, the only significant problem that I see is the, the political system in the US is, is a bit erratic, let's put it this way, and it may prevent the Federal Reserve. Remember, in 2008, the Federal Reserve could do whatever they want, more or less, introducing a set of policies that stabilize shadow banking uh, and introducing swap lines that allowed the US to fulfill, in a sense, its role of lenders of last resort of US dollars for the rest of the world, right? Now, I don't know, and I've heard people worrying about the possibility that if Donald Trump continues to be president, he might say, well, I'm not giving you my dollars. Uh, these swap lines that we have institutionalized and they are permanent, you know, everything permanent could become very, very temporary if the president of the United States wa wants it to. So, so in that sense, I, I mean, I, I think central banks have the tools 
I'm not quite sure that all of them will be allowed to use these tools by, by politicians. And I hopefully do not get to see a crisis where Donald Trump is president, uh, or maybe as a former Marxist, I want to see a crisis where Donald Trump is president because it will sharpen the contradictions of capitalism very seriously. Um, that's my answer. But structurally, I think we have instruments. The central banks have instruments, and they have tested them over and over again. And I would not worry about not having thwarting mechanisms to address instability of shadow banking. We might not have the political willingness to do so, but that, you know, is outside control. Yes, please. You are absolutely right about instruments of the central Yes, yeah, sure. That instruments of the central bank should be used. What instruments? Mm. In the United Kingdom, there is the financial contract, the financial policy authority mm. that it's, it was created after the financial crisis, but they don't have the tools. And there is also uh, political objections mm. to them doing anything. In Europe, there is no such a committee. In the United States, the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010 provided mm. um, a case whereby the, the parallel banking sector will be controlled. Mm. But, as, you, as I'm sure you appreciate, the current president decided to repeal the Dodd-Frank Act. Mm. Also, the two houses decided the same, and the um, Federal Reserve System relevant committee decided last March mm. to abandon the Dodd-Frank Act. Mm. And uh, ever since 2010, nothing has happened in terms of the shadow banking sector as they had imposed. I, I, I would respectfully disagree there. I mean, you're right that we have, we, after 2008, eight, we had a pretty, I mean, it's, it wasn't a, a a fully blown structural transformation of the financial system in the way that you had it after 1929, but it was still uh, a set of pretty convincing policies. Uh, I'm thinking about Basel III, I'm thinking about, well, watered down FSB, and, but I'm thinking more about uh, the fact that Bank of England and, and the Federal Reserve through QE and other measures are basically propping up securities markets. And if you prop up securities markets, you can prop up shadow banking very easily. Uh, and that's why I'm putting this graph here, because the OMTs, remember, outright monetary transactions, are a way of propping up securities markets to say, if market liquidity uh, evaporates, that will trigger margin calls, and it could trigger what the literature calls haircuts and liquidity spirals, it's fine, we will come as a central bank and inject liquidity in any market and make sure that you don't get destabilizing uh, interactions between market and funding liquidity. So that is there. Yes, there are, there are weakenings of the regulatory framework, but the central bank in theory can take on its balance sheet the entire financial system. And it has now, in some countries, the formal tools to do so. Whether it will be allowed to do so, it's, it's a different question. I, I think probably yes, in, in, even in the United States, but it is a politic, it's not a question of tools to me. The, the tools are there, the sorting mechanisms are there, central banks understand to some extent how they work, although I have some doubts because of the, I don't know if you follow the, the tensions in the US repo markets in September, which suggest to me that either some very important uh, uh, kind of human capital has been lost to the Fed who understands how the repo markets work, or the, 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 the structural imbalances in the financial system in the, in the US are playing out uh, in, in the repo market. But that's n not a problem to deal with. I mean, if the central bank wants it, it just buys US treasuries, and if, and if it can find whoever to, who, somebody to sell them the treasuries, it, it can just buy them and inject liquidity, both funding liquidity and market liquidity in the system. That I have very little concern about that. The problem is outside the US, in countries that have US dollar exposures, uh, if they need to draw on swap lines and, the federal, and Donald Trump doesn't allow them to which I think is not an impossible scenario. Yeah. Thank you. Done. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.